All right, uh, I think we can get started. Thank you all for joining us for today's Lunchtime Art Talk, which as many of you know, is a weekly series led by Hammer curators on works from our collection. This series will focus on artists featured in Made in LA, a version. As the galleries are unfortunately closed to the public due to the pandemic, we thought it was important to highlight works by the incredible artists selected for this year's biennial. My name is Nika Chilowicz and I'm a curatorial assistant at the Hammer Museum. Uh, and I have the great pleasure of facilitating this afternoon's talk on Katya Sai. Joining me today is my colleague, curatorial assistant, Vanessa Arismendi, who will help me answer all of your questions later in the program. A few Zoom notes before we begin. If you haven't already done so, please select speaker view in the top right corner of your screen. And in the top middle of your screen, please click on view options to ensure side by side and fit to window are checked. Please note that today's program is being recorded. You have the option to toggle your camera on and off using the camera icon in the bottom left corner, whatever you most feel comfortable with. You will remain on mute until the end of the presentation, at which point Vanessa will help me unmute those who have questions. During the presentation, if you have any questions for me or Vanessa or have any technical questions, you can ask them using the chat feature. Um, and I have an out of date version of my script, but I just wanted to mention a special thank you to Bank of America who helped uh, fund the Made in LA show that hopefully everyone will have a chance to see uh, soon. So um, Josephine, if you can pull up my slides, I will start. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk today about Katya Saib who is a painter born and trained in Dusseldorf uh, and who's been living in Los Angeles for the past few years. Um, I'm starting this presentation with an installation view of the two of the three large scale portraits um, and paintings that Katya made specifically for Made in LA, um, just to give you a little bit of a sense. I know it's strange to only see it in images of um, how these works operate in, in space. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So Katya Saib um, is a painter who uh, approaches the canvas as a figurative, um, psychologically charged and metaphorical space. She often paints on raw Hessian and non-traditional surfaces like textiles, uh, which um, you can see in some of the other works. They're also hard to capture uh, digitally. But there's she's an artist who is incredibly technically gifted um, and has a very sophisticated and complex and complete um, view on the painting as a representational space, um, but also on um, the role of surface texture, brushwork, line, um, and of course, color. Um, her paintings are laden with psychological life and emotional desire and operate using um, certain uh, metaphorical, iconographical and symbolic techniques. Um, she really constructs these stories uh, that are sites of suggestion that use um, the uncanny to sort of wrap you into the painting and then through form and material, um, break the sort of complete uh, illusion of the painting surface and make you recall uh, herself as an artist, um, the painting as a representational space, um, and then pull you right back into um, this sort of mystical and magical visual narrative that she so artfully constructs. Um, so this is a, one, the first work uh, called Mona Lisa's Smile. And if we can go to the next slide, we can see a little bit up close. So here you can really get a sense just of her incredible um, maneuvering of paint um, and the way that through these very exacting um, brush strokes, she sort of builds this illusor illusory space um, that almost looks three-dimensional or like a lenticular. Uh, you can see in the title um, these constant references to painting as a narrative space, almost as a cinematic space, 
um, and a very uh, academic and well-informed uh, understanding of paintings history. And in particular with Katya's work, you can really see um, the Western European Judeo-Christian history of painting and a real um, sort of playing with and uh, engaging with the representation of women within paintings history and the sort of reappropriation or um, taking back of painting psychological space from a really situated um, female worldview. So in this painting, you can see it's, it's titled Mona Lisa's Smile. And if you look at um, the vase beneath it, the, the reflection on the table is of Mona Lisa herself. And then you sort of see it within this vase that is sort of um, somewhere between a crystal ball um, and of course the vase, a more caricatured representation that looks sort of like a Japanese anime. Um, the portrait of the woman who I think is based on the artist herself is sort of conjuring up this narrative that she's telling you. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Oh no, sorry, back. You can see certain visual cues that sort of build out this narrative of the woman, like a wedding ring, which suggests that she has a family life. Um, the rose has a spider web in it, which again, sort of conjures to these uncanny spaces um, and to something that I think is a theme that we'll see throughout Katya's portraiture, which is the sort of bad woman or mysterious woman. Um, that is a little bit unsettling, but uh, very seductive uh, and psychologically charged. So if we can go to the next slide now. Um, this work is called Temptation, and I think you can see even more so how Katya uh, is playing with perspective, with depth, with the canvas's surface. Um, this work is actually a diptych, uh, which you can see from the little line that is placed off center in the painting's composition. Again, there is sort of these references to traditional, um, I would say Renaissance painting and these sort of foundational um, metaphors that are used to describe um, female subjectivity or subjectivity in general, but the way that Katya approaches it in her works is it's always a little bit off kilter or off centered. And you're, while you're so drawn into the world, the vi rich visual world in each painting, she sort of pulls you back out of it again and makes you aware that you are looking at a painting that, that every decision is um, calculated. Um, and here, I think you can really see that through not only this sort of off-centered nature of the diptych, but the um, building out of the central character here in this portrait, uh, which I think uh, she used her gallerist as a subject, um, at, which is foregrounded on the canvas. And then this sort of distorted um, view of her hand um, that's over a piece of paper and uh, with a little a droplet of blood dripping down. So if you can go to the next slide, I have a close up here. Um, you can see it better. And, and I, I, from this very loaded image, pull um, sort of an exploration of the blank canvas or the blank page and the sort of emotional tension um, and sight of really pain and suffering. Uh, that one approaches creative production with, or when you're faced with um, sort of the great task of constructing a world from nothing. Um, and in this painting, you can see something that, that repeats throughout her work very heavily, which is the image of the serpent. Um, you can see it in the background behind uh, the main subject's hand as a sort of um, more rudimentary build out spiral that's a little more abstract, but then you really see it in the foreground in this sort of heavily layered uh, textural, almost um, textile looking serpent that is in direct communication with this subject and sort of looks like it wants to drink her blood. Um, and the serpent is a really, really traditional um, and classic metaphor in Western Judeo-Christian painting, specifically um, as sort of a tool for describing 
the female sexuality and the danger in female sensuality and female uh, subjectivity. So um, if we can go to the next slide. This is uh, another large scale diptych uh, that Katya made for Made in LA called Bang Bang, He Shot Me Down. And here you can see again, just the very skillful, almost cinematic uh, construction of the canvas. There is a story here of what looks like to me to be a murder scene and somebody um, all dressed in white, this sort of ethereal subject that is exiting the room. Um, this work is ripe and filled again with visual cues. And if you go to the next slide, um, I pulled up some detail shots where you can really just get a sense of Katya's masterful um, understanding and exploration of color. Um, she's really built out from this dense, dark, moody um, purple, a very layered um, and deep visual space that you really can just dive into. Um, and you see the, the woman's foot, two feet sticking out um, in different areas that she's just fallen off the bed, her gloves, which sort of look like there could be of her ghost or her spirit leaving her body um, and um, the shoe on the bed, as well as the detail work on the bed frame and the sort of on the left, you see the, um, you see pictures on the wall, which is another theme that repeats throughout Katya's work. I see it really as a meta reference to painting and to the painting surface, which again is a really traditional uh, gesture and tool in Renaissance painting for reminding the viewer of the artist's subjectivity um, and role in, in constructing the world uh, that takes place on the canvas. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, these are some earlier works on the left. It's called, uh, the work is titled The Darkest Hours Just Before the Dawn. Um, which is oil on fabric and knitted wool. Again, these sort of layered and um, textures and uh, textiles that sort of, I think also really reflect and, and look to uh, the domestic space and sort of women's um, relegation to in art history, these more domestic or craft spheres, which Katya really elevates in her canvases and incorporates in a really artful way. And on the right, you see Medusa in vain. Um, again, both works uh, engage this question of the serpent. Um, this, there's the repetition of mirrors and of portals which run throughout Katya's work. And these sort of mysterious, what I see as like bad or dangerous women which repeat throughout the, um, the subjects of her work, the portraits in her work. So uh, if you can go to the next slide. Um, again, there is uh, this sort of like oracle and the crystal ball, which appears again, that is laden with um, metaphorical um, images. And uh, yeah, so I think next slide. And here's um, another example called You Made Your Bed, Now Sleep in It, where you can really see a total rupture of um, representational space to a full dreamscape um, with this sort of, sort of terrifying baker's hands above this woman in a really seductive um, pose laying in her bed. And here you're, we're fully in um, a dream world or in a fantasy space. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to, and we'll have to move quickly through these because our time is short, but you know, um, these works are very particular within the landscape of Made in LA, Katya's works, and um, there's a very deep sense and exploration of female subjectivity as a visual sensibility and a pictorial strategy, an illustrative tool and a way of seeing, and a very brazen and artful and sophisticated sort of appropriation of art historical gestures and traditional um, painting history 
to sort of service the exploration of the situated or autonomous uh, female psychology and female individuality. So I just wanted to end through a very quick um, overview of some other artists that I really think Katya's work is in dialogue with that really pull from an art history of uh, surrealism and of women artists using um, representational space and surrealist approaches to uh, composition and to image making um, to service and to sort of stake a claim and a space for um, female subjectivity and the state of what it is like to be a woman in the world. Um, I think it's important in, in sort of zooming out a little bit and looking back and around um, at a community of, of female identifying painters like Katya's to put some context to the fact that this is a community of artists who uh, consciously and unconsciously are speaking to one another. And as we are sort of at this critical moment of how we reimagine and think through art history and the role of museums, I personally think it's very important to identify um, genealogies and communities of women and queer artists who are um, looking at one another or who together create a community that we as viewers and publics and curators can look to and think about as we um, reimagine a more uh, inclusive and diverse and dynamic future for um, museums and art history. So the, the three that I'll just uh, mention here and Vanessa will drop links into the chat. I can't include images for copyright reasons, but are Frida Kahlo um, and her uh, artful constructions of painting psychological space. Leonora Carrington, also a Mexican painter and Remedios Baro. Um, also, one of my personal favorites is Leonor Fini, an Argentinian uh, painter who just really creates these very uh, sexy and seductive images of female sensuality. Um, and here we'll, I'll just dive in very quickly, I know I'm out of time, into some other artists that I really see in dialogue with um, Katya's work. So this is Carla Kaplun, um, a Mexican artist. Um, if we can go to the next slide. This is uh, another personal favorite, Frida Toranzo Jaeger, a Mexican and German artist. And here you can see a triptych. Um, she's playing with the triptych and with some classic um, Renaissance gestures in particular. Here I see Las Meninas, Velasquez, and the sort of breaking of the painting's fourth wall through these little uh, puppies, Pomeranians, that stare out um, at at the viewer. Um, and again, this sort of repurposing of traditional canonical art historical techniques that Katya's work uh, does so artfully um, and breaking of that to look at uh, female subjectivity and se sexuality in this uh, work in particular. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a Canadian painter, Ambera Wellman. Um, I'm just gonna run through these and I think that you guys will be able to see um, how I'm, I'm viewing this community of artists in relation to Katya's work. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is Adriana Minoliti, an uh, Argentinian artist who looks at the question of queer female sexuality and the cyborg in contemporary space. Uh, next slide. This is an LA based artist, Casey Jane Ellison. And these are actually uh, Photoshop paintings on mirror. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you can see the mirror peeking through. That's the artist taking a selfie of herself in her work. Um, and again, this approach to uh, female portraiture um, to portals and vanity sort of as a tool and point of entry into the female psychological space. Um, and yeah, next slide. Two younger Mexican artists on the left, you have Paloma Contreras Lomas and on the white, uh, right, Wendy Cabrera Rubio. Uh, and both of these artists also uh, approach uh, traditional Mexican surrealism um, and the psychological space of Disney or mainstream media culture uh, within Mexican culture. And on the right, um, Wendy's work is made out of textile. So again, there is this sort of very skilled uh, repurposing within representational space of textiles, which runs throughout Kutch's work as well. 
Uh, next slide. This is Chloe Wilcox, uh, US uh, painter. And here again, there is a more sort of formal and representational engagement with textile and the creation of depth within the canvas. Um, and also this sort of uncanny and ominous space psychological space within the canvas that you really see throughout the sort of mysterious elements that repeat throughout Katya's work. Uh, next slide. Um, and here I will end on, this image is a little blurry, but I'll end on Katya's uh, installation at the Huntington. Uh, these are a series of portraits that the artist began when first moving to Los Angeles a, a couple of years ago. Uh, and they were really based on, she was struck by the diversity of, of people that you see walking around Los Angeles, especially in the downtown area um, where her studio is. And she began this series of portraits of people that she knew and people that she said to me, she didn't know, but knew. Um, so this is an ongoing project that she has been working on. If you go to the next slide, I picked two to pull up on and really zoom in on uh, to just give us a last look at her just really incredible um, understanding of painting's history, but also just exploration and of the medium and joy of the medium. You know, the more you look at these paintings, the more you want to look at these paintings. Um, and um, this is an ongoing series. And again, I'll just mention before we close, you see on the left, this there is the use of a picture within a picture of another sort of um, bad or bad woman who's wrapped in a snake and you can't really tell if the snake is strangling her or if she is wearing the snake as a sort of fabulous uh, fashion statement. Uh, so I guess that I'll leave that here for now um, and we can open it up to questions or comments or um, well, yeah. So Vanessa, take it away. Thank you, Nika, that was great. Um, as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question to Nika, please either raise your hand physically or digitally by going into the participants panel and clicking raise hand. I'll try to keep an eye out for all of you. And you can also drop your questions in the chat. Um, okay, and I think we have our first question, Nika. Uh, figurative painting seems to make up a significant por portion of Mila 2020. Why do you think so many younger artists and painters have embraced figuration over abstraction? Um, that is a great question and something that I thought about a lot uh, as I was diving into Katja's work in particular. It is um, a central theme in this Made in LA and um, I think Katja's work in particular has a little bit, you know, there are some themes that run through figuration and using figurative space to sort of broach different subjects within artistic subjectivity and art history. I would say that um, Katya's work in particular, there is sort of a um, direct and brave uh, engagement with art history, with Western art history in particular. Um, and just a real desire to, through art making, tell stories and create narrative space, I think um, it, can be as simple as that with a lot of these paintings. Um, and I would also say, you know, all of the, the artists who are using figurative space within Made in LA, um, there's a deep understanding of media culture, of the way that images function and circulate within contemporary culture, the way we're constantly passively just consuming these representations of identity, subjectivity in Katya's work, uh, female psychological um, space and, and self-representation. Um, so I think that that uh, is a major reason why younger artists are really looking back at figurative space rather than abstract space. Um, I will also just say on a personal level and really in Katya's work and the sort of um, surrealist non-US histories that I'm, I'm bringing up within it is that abstract painting is uh, really instrumentalized by the United States Museum enterprise after World War II over figurative painting. And there's this sort of systematic rejection of Mexican and uh, Latin American painters who use rep uh, figurative space um, as sort of a direct link to communism. And so I think that artists who are looking back at 
representational space are doing it from also a really strategic um, looking outside of the male, white male heterosexual dominated space of abstract painting and abstract expressionism in particular. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question a little bit. I have a related question. So uh, I, I did, hadn't seen Katya's work before this presentation and I'm thinking about the first couple of paintings especially. And they really remind me of Belkis Aeon's lenticulars. Um, just obviously in the way that they both remix Judeo-Christian mythology and, you know, they nod towards traditions of female prophecy, but also in the way they use texture and color and the dimensionality of the surface itself. Um, has Katya talked about Belkis or uh, a lineage to Cuban printmaking or Cuban painting? That is a very good question. I, and I see what you're talking about uh in the construction of the canvas. And I'm not totally sure um, how aware uh, Katya is of Belkis's work, but I do uh, appreciate and think that, you know, it's also a part of the curator and art historian's job to pull together these networks of non-US uh, based artists and to really um, create those connections. So I really value that insight into the work. Um, and then we have a question from Brad Yasukochi. How can these paintings and different artworks influence the young female artists that want to start diversifying their own art? I feel like this might be related to the question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that I appreciate so much about Katya's work is just this sense of bravery and a boldness when approaching the canvas. Um, she just, doesn't hold back and dives right in. And she's, um, these works are sophisticated. They are art historical. They are um, iconographic. Um, and I think that really uh, for younger artists and as a younger curator, I value them and, and look to them to sort of set a tone for a, a level of brazenness and bravery when approaching uh, art making and especially a space that is as psychologically and historically charged as, the, as painting and, and the canvas. Um, it looks like we also have a question from visitor Judy Roth. Your description of her paintings, are they your words and opinions or hers? Um, they are my words and opinions. And I think one of one something that is worth mentioning when talking about Katya's work is that each painting and across um, her art making, there are, you know, there's a real narrative that she's creating and recreating and telling. Um, and there are, it's they're filled with uh, clues and with ways into the paintings, but she never explicitly explains anything to you. Her titles and her use of language, I think only add to the mystery of each painting. Um, and that uh, is a really specific decision so that each viewer is really bringing to the paintings their own psychological space and emotional space. So these are really a reflection of what I see uh, in the work. And I'll never fully know how right or wrong I am, but her works are really um, an invitation for everyone to bring their own subjectivity um, to the space that she creates within her canvases. Uh, Do you know if she writes or if she's, I, I think I asked you this already, but has she explored writing as a part of the practice as well? Because I feel like that would definitely, I don't know, I definitely see her as a writer too. Um, yeah, I mean, there is a, deep understanding of language and a very deep, I think, sophisticated understanding of the relationship between verbal language and pictorial language that runs throughout her works. Um, I am, I, I see her paintings as fables, as pieces of writing, um, but I am not sure how much she, uh, you know, sees herself as a writer, but these are, de they're definitely narrative artworks. Um, yeah. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Again, you can raise your hand physically or digitally, or you can drop your question in the chat. Um, otherwise, Nika, do you wanna? Well, I guess I would just say, and I know that, that uh, we're all sitting at home 
uh, desperate, I know I am, to look at uh, some artwork in real life, but that if everyone gets a chance to, when the world starts to open up again, see these works in person because they are immense and um, the whole layer of textiles and weaving of an approach to surface, uh, these images really don't do it justice. So I just invite you all to go see the works in person when we can. Okay. Bye everyone, have a great day.